Hello, everybody, and welcome to Taking Control, the ADHD podcast on True Story FM. I'm Pete Wright, and I'm here with Nikki Kinzer. Hello, everyone. Hello, Pete Wright. Nikki, I'm just plum miserable. Oh, no. I know. This, I, I went to the dock yesterday. I have to go back today. I have discs that are swollen in oh, my back. Oh, that just sounds and painful. It's so painful and stupid. Uh, did something happen? Like, did you injure yourself in some way? Or? As with all things back related, back and neck related for me, it happened while sleeping. And so uh, I don't that is know, dangerous. But it just <laughs> yes. keeps it just keeps growing. It started in the lower back. Now it's like radiating pain. I'm miserable. So we're going to do this show. And then immediately after I shall fall down. And okay. that's what I have to offer today. Is, <laughs> All right. Is being a victim of gravity. <laughs> oh, I'm uh, sorry. I'm so excited about this show. It, this starts uh, because I got a question I months ago. We got a question by mm -hmm. way of my wife who said, have you ever done a show on this new parent thing? Like what it means to be a new parent and get diagnosed with ADHD. And uh, it turns out we have a fantastic resource who can help us walk through the answer to this question in Dr. Marcy Caldwell. And she's going to join us very shortly. Uh, we've missed Marcy. It's been a long time since she's been back to the show. And uh, I'm excited to welcome her back. Uh, before we get started, sure. however, head over to Take Control ADHD, get to know us, dot com, get to know us a little bit better. You can listen to the show right there on the website or subscribe to the mailing list, and we will send you an email each time a new episode is released. You can connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, or Pinterest at Take Control ADHD, and jump into our Discord server, TakeControlADHD.com slash Discord. That'll take you to the inv invite screen where you can jump in and, and join our public community channel. If you would like a little bit more, you can always check out our Patreon patreon.com slash the ADHD podcast will get you access to the super triple secret discord channels, early access feed for the podcast, access to lots and lots of other benefits that come with. Did membership. you happen to talk about placeholder? Did that just come up? No, well, not. I just right. want to make sure that people know how awesome <laughs> your podcast is. I don't know how awesome the podcast is, but it's, it uh, is. you know, I'm terrible at that. But I, I deeply enjoy doing it. How about that? If you're interested okay. in, in listening to a podcast called Placeholder that Pete does, a show about the tech we're using today while we're waiting for something better, that Pete really enjoys doing but makes no claims to quality or insight, then you should do that. And you get that by becoming a member at any level of our Patreon, patreon.com slash the ADHD podcast. Thank you for uh, your support there. But you know how giddy I get when I get to talk about our uh, our advertiser Text. this week. Text expander. Text expander. I'm always text finding expander. new ways to use text expander. You've heard me say it before. It is one of my very favorite. I call it an invisible tool. Do you know what I mean by invisible tool? Nikki. It's just there. It just does things for you. And you don't even know it's going to do it. It, it just, just does it. Works. That's exactly it just works. Right. You just like magic fingers. You do a thing on your keyboard and then magically it just works. It just does right. stuff. It, it's running in the background. It's just waiting for me to type an abbreviation or a snippet in text expander speak. And then when it sees that snippet, it goes to work instantly expanding from just a few characters on my keyboard to words, sentences, paragraphs, entire pages of text. I'm writing an email. I just hit semicolon PW. Pete Wright, that's my name. If I hit semicolon PW, three keys, it expands to my entire email signature, whatever I have in there. It's got amazing, amazing features. That's just one little tiny thing. Today, we're talking about new parenting. And if you are crazed with details that come from uh, trying to figure out how to manage your life with new parenting, maybe saving some time at your computer is it might be useful for you. If that's the case, True. you should absolutely check out Text Expander. You set it once in Text Expander, you build your snippet library of whatever text you find you're sending to doctors, to caregivers, to, as you'll find in this show, your superhero, Night Doula. Anything you need to type, you save it once, you get it perfect, and then you can create it on the fly easily, easily, easily. Uh, but it's not just for me. As it happens, I'm on two teams of people that actually work in Text Expander too, and I hope you will explore the team features. The way Text Expander say, says it, your team's knowledge is at their fingertips. That's true. But what I love about it is if I write something and I put it in our Text Expander team library, I know that when they use it, it won't be screwed up. Like they'll get it exactly as we created it every time 
perfectly. It is easier for everyone. Get your whole team on the same page by getting information out of silos and in the hands of everyone who needs it. You can share your team's knowledge across departments so your team is sending unified messages to your customers and isn't spending time reinventing the wheel. So just very quickly, a reminder how it works. First, you put your snippets into the Text Expander snippet library. Second, you can share it optionally with other people that you use snippets. Maybe it's with your partner, your spouse. Uh, maybe it's with your older children and you need to make sure they have all their numbers right every time they use it, whatever. And then you expand it. You just type a few keys and Text Expander sees those keys and creates and expands your snippet wherever you're writing on any, any device. Text Expander is available on Mac and Windows and Chrome and iPhone and iPad. It's everywhere. And for listeners of the ADHD podcast, you can get 20% off your first year of service. All you have to do is visit TakeControlADHD.com slash Text Expander. Very easy to remember because it's us. And then Text Expander, TakeControlADHD.com slash Text Expander. It will whisk you over to our page on their site where you can get started. Again, get started now and you'll save 20% off your subscription. The way we work is changing rapidly. Make work work the way your brain works by saying more in less time with less effort using Text Expander. Our great thanks to the Text Expander team for sponsoring the ADHD podcast. And now let's talk to Marcy, shall we? Let's. Marcy? Marcy Caldwell is director and supervising psychologist at Rittenhouse Psychological Assessments and is a licensed clinical psychologist who's been specializing in the treatment of assessment of ADHD and learning disabilities for over 15 years. She joins us today to answer some of our frequent questions about parenting and ADHD. Marcy, welcome back to the ADHD podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. So this whole thing started uh, because I got a question. <laughs> my po <laughs> my podcast dog is is doing a little bit of resettling. <laughs> yes, yes. Are you, are you okay? He is. Can you lie down? <laughs> Just relax. It's going to be fine. Thank you. You're good. <laughs> You're good. All right. This whole thing started with a conversation with my, uh, I was having with my wife and she told me she was having a conversation with one of the women who works with her, who was just diagnosed with ADHD. And she said, I didn't even know, I didn't even have a, a framework for understanding that I had ADHD until I became a mom. She got her diagnosis right after, uh, you know, in the first year or two, I think that she she was a mom and the stresses of becoming a mom unleashed some things that she did not know about herself. And uh, I thought that might make for a really interesting conversation mm -hmm. about ADHD diagnoses coming after you become a parent. What is it about becoming a new parent that uh, allows you to see some new things about yourself regarding ADHD? Yeah, for sure. I think there are, we, we see this a lot. That's one of the time periods where we see a lot of adult diagnosis happening. And, you know, and it makes sense kind of across the lifespan, we tend to see diagnoses happening in these kind of critical moments where there's a lot going on, right? So we see it kind of in, in the like seven to eight year old range when we're just starting to really kind of introduce heavy academics. We see it again in middle school. We see it again in college and grad school. When we start to introduce new demands, we start to get kind of these peaks of ADHD diagnoses. Sure. Um, so what bigger <laughs> new demand is there than new motherhood? Um, when all of a sudden your entire life has been transformed um, from the outside um, and from the inside. Um, and so, you know, there's so many different things happening in um, early motherhood, right? There's all the hormonal changes. There's a giant lifestyle change that has occurred. Um, there is the relationship changes that occur. And then there's all of the additional demands on, on you and on your life um, and on your responsibilities that come in as well. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think all of these things tend to then coalesce into being such a giant, um, 
I keep wanting to say burden, but that's a terrible word for yeah, early mother. Yeah, probably right? not um, a great word. <laughs> but a, 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 a giant battle of responsibilities. Um, yeah. Your whole life is, just changes. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. I also think there's something here about women often not seeking out diagnoses when it's just for themselves, right? That if it's just something about, oh, like, I can get through that, you know, it's hard, but it's hard for everyone. Um, I'll just kind of muddle through and get there. But when it then impacts a child, um, it often then makes it more clear, more obvious, and it then kind of propels women to then do something else, do something additional, because they then start to see how it's impacting other people. So it's that it's that child. that trigger of becoming a new mom that those new stresses that that make it apparent that it's time for me to act. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that it, those stresses are now impacting somebody other than herself. Yeah, right. When it's just impacting herself okay, whatever, I'll, I'll deal with it. Right. But now it's impacting somebody else and somebody that I care deeply about. Um, now it's time to, to deal with it on a different level. Well, and I wonder, and, and you might be able to answer this, how many, and I don't even know if we can actually answer this now that I'm thinking about it. My, my, my thought process here is going to inattentive ADHD right? Because I just recently did an interview about inattentive ADHD and how sometimes those diagnoses get missed because they're, they, they don't have as much of the hyperactivity. And I'm wondering, like, is there a connection to having an inattentive ADHD, not really realizing that that's what it is? And then you have this big, huge life change and bam, all this stuff starts happening. Like, is there any connection there? Well, I think that Inattentive ADHD goes under the radar more, right? Because it doesn't impact the outside world as much. It's a very kind of internal experience. And it's it's kind of the residue of inattentive ADHD that then gets picked up by other people, right? That residue being kind of um, in childhood, it's things like missed homework assignments or not not understanding concepts in adulthood, you know, it's kind of missing out on conversation pieces, missing out on, on, um, deadlines, things like that. Um, and, but those are, um, more easily kind of covered over. And I think a lot of women in particular have a lot of pressure to fit in and to kind of blend and to, um, be good um, and be good and, moms, right? Yeah, like good there's, moms yeah. and, and wives and all the rest, right? Um, daughters. And so um, it's very, it's very tempting to try to kind of cover those symptoms over so they don't get seen by the outside world and picked up. And, and therefore, you know, somebody says, Hey, what's going on? Um, and add to that that women um, are more likely to have inattentive ADHD than hyperactive ADHD. Um, and so women go a whole lot longer. There are a lot of reasons why women go a whole lot longer without a diagnosis than boys and men. Mm-hmm. Um, but that is definitely one of the reasons. What about the, the physiological? Uh, are there physiological hormonal changes that actually uh, are, are sort of more or less directly attributed to, you know, ADHD in the course of becoming a new mom? Yeah, definitely. One of the things when we're talking about hormones, so basic kind of primer is that... I need, I need um, a primer. Thank you. That's yeah. good. Primer, <laughs> I do that's too. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the two hormones most at play for women are estrogen and progesterone. Um, and estrogen... Um, helps our brains um, metabolize dopamine, which is one of the biggest neurotransmitters at play in ADHD, right? Um, And also one of the biggest transmitters at play with ADHD medication. Um, Progesterone um, makes makes it harder for um, 
dopamine to be absorbed. Um, and so as these two hormones are in flux throughout a woman's menstrual cycle and then also throughout pregnancy, we see ma pretty major changes. So the first trimester of pregnancy can be extremely difficult for women with ADHD because we see this huge increase in progesterone. Um, and we also see an increase in estrogen, but we see this huge increase in progesterone that kind of diminishes the positive benefit of estrogen estrogen. Um, and so ADHD symptoms can get a lot worse. Um, but then we kind of see this plateauing of mostly just estrogen, um, which keeps symptoms pretty, pretty good. Um, in fact, a lot of women will report that they, they feel fine. Um, they feel like they're medicated, even though they're not um, in their second and third trimester. And then in the fourth trimester, so the postpartum period, there is an almost 200% decrease of estrogen um, in that kind of three-month period. So there's this like giant nosedive of estrogen, which then creates all of the mood changes that we see in that early stage, as well as a huge ballooning of ADHD symptoms. That is fascinating. Nikki, did you know mm -hmm. this? I didn't know any of this. No, I didn't. And I'm so curious because I just had somebody ask me the other day, and I, I don't know the answer, but I bet you do, Marcy. Uh, <laughs> she asked me that if um, when you're on your period, if the ADHD meds work less. Yes, they do. And they do. Um, okay. They're much less effective in the second, in that luteal um, stage. So that, that second, the last two weeks of a menstrual cycle. Mm -hmm. um, and they, and particularly during those kind of premenstrual symptoms. So in the, you know, three to five days before a period begins. That they'll be they'll be less effective. Less effective yeah. and ADHD symptoms will be worse. Be worse. It's like a double whammy. I, I want to stay on the new mom. I do, but I do have another question because this comes up so much with my clients. So perimenopause and menopause then, what happens with ADHD in, in those shift of hormones? Yeah, so the same kind of scenario where yeah, yeah. ADHD symptoms get worse um, and ADHD bands tend to be less effective. Interesting, okay. But yeah. Okay, back to the babies. That, well, yeah, that <laughs> second and third trimester are so effective that really what you're saying is you should just remain constantly and sustainably pregnant for all your whole the time. Life. All <laughs> whole your life, whole, yeah. During your entire childbearing years, you'll be fine. So yeah, many children, yeah. but yeah, no yeah. ADHD <laughs> symptoms. <laughs> And nothing, there's no downside to that plan whatsoever. No, no, no. Right, because, right. No, because we're only focused on right now, Marcy. I don't know if you know this about ADHD. <laughs> now, All I care now, about is doesn't yeah. matter. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So yeah, I have another question. This is so fascinating mm -hmm. to me. Um, all right. So being a new mom, you don't have sleep. I mean, there's no sleep, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember being so excited after getting four straight hours of sleep. And I thought that that was just the most exciting thing in the world. So how do you know the difference between this is really hard? I'm, I don't have any sleep. I don't maybe have a lot of help or I'm struggling. Um, how do you know if that's ADHD getting worse or it's just the situation that I'm in is not, it, it's hard. It's a hard yeah. situation. It's so hard. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it, and it is, it's so hard for all moms. And I do really think that it is harder for ADHD moms because yes. sleep is so crucial. Um, in fact, research shows that there is a substantial difference in, um, in, in the quality of life between new ADHD parents and just new non-ADHD parents. Mm -hmm. But the differential there um, disappears when you take into account sleep quality. Um, and so that shows you how incredibly essential this is, but also how hard it is for ADHD brains to sleep, um, oh. let alone ADHD brains who are being woken up every you know, 90 to whatever, 120 minutes, um, you know, that the, it's hard enough for an ADHD brain to get to sleep the first time, 
let alone have to get to sleep five times in a row. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's almost, you know, impossible for an ADHD brain to function when that sleep quality um, and sleep duration isn't good enough. Um, you know, we, we see if you deprive a neurotypical brain of just an hour of sleep a night for a week, just an hour, which, I mean, we do that all the time, right? Mm -hmm. um, for a week, we get ADHD-level executive functioning deficits, and that's in a neurotypical brain. So imagine what happens in an ADHD brain when it's deprived of sleep and to the degree that it is in new motherhood. Um, so, yeah, it's really, really hard, and I don't even know... You know, whenever I talk with new moms, I don't even try to disentangle what's ADHD and what's yeah. new parenthood and what's lack of sleep, right? Like, it's just all here. Yeah. And we're yeah. just going to have to deal with everything that's here right because now. This is right? how you're feeling. This is what's yeah. happening. It yeah. doesn't matter what the label is or the diagnosis. No, or it really doesn't. Yeah. You're never going like, to. Yeah. How do you even know? Yeah. 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 Right. And I don't think you can. And, and you know, and. And in terms of kind of getting a new diagnosis in that postpartum period, I don't even know that I would recommend that right then, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's just like, we just got to get through. <laughs> it feels, it feels um, like you're sort of panning for gold, right? Like you're, you have all this, this cornucopia of all the different things that look like ADHD maybe, mm -hmm. but it sounds like what you're waiting for is give yourself lots of time after you become a new parent and see what sifts out, see what sticks exactly. around. Because yeah. if it all goes yeah. away, you're fine. But you might discover some new things about yourself. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah. Yeah. Let's get you some sleep. Let's yeah. let's get some routines back in your life. Let's, you know, get some help around here. And then let's figure this out. Yeah. Um, but with all those things up in the air, it's pretty hard to figure that out. I, I just a slight sidebar on on diagnosing of new parents in particular. Do you see the same sort of trends for new dads? Obviously, less hormonal based, but behavioral. Yeah. So, and, and I don't, I don't, I'm not going to speak to this in specific, but there is some interesting research about hormonal changes that happen in new fatherhood, um, which are fascinating. Um, but I don't know enough to <laughs> speak at length about does, them. Does um, it involve sympathy weight gain? Because my God, I still, I spent 20 years. I still haven't shaken. <laughs> there is definitely some sympathy <laughs> weight gain happening. <laughs> <laughs> it's all normal. Yeah, right. uh, is there a higher likelihood for an ADHD mom to have postpartum depression? Is that an issue yes. at all? Yeah. Yes. So that's um, something to look out for. Yeah. Higher likelihood for depression and postpartum anxiety. Mm -hmm. I don't. I, did you finish yeah. the question about dads? I, I feel like you no. never finished the question about dads. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I need I'm to sorry. Hear the I, we to went that. to the weight gain, and I was just yeah. like, uh, "Yeah, you're normal. You're good." Yeah. Yeah. No, I want to hear the rest of that. Yeah, so postpartum dad, postpartum dads, if that's a thing, um, dads in the postpartum phase of life um, are um, do have an increase in ADHD symptoms as well. It tends to be, as you said, less related to hormonal changes and more about responsibility changes, total loss of structure, and any routines that were in place. Um, and this complete lifestyle change that just occurred, right? Um, and 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 so we see a change happening in dads with ADHD, new dads with ADHD. We also see um, some significant issues with, you know, if if a partnership is a mom with ADHD and a dad without ADHD, um, we also see some a lot of distress happening with that. Um, non ADHD partner as well. But you say distress. What is that? How do you? What does that look like? Um, so that looks like psychological distress, right? So um, either some symptoms of depression, symptoms of anxiety, um, and struggling to kind of adapt to the changing demands. Um, and we see increased levels in, of that distress in. Um, non ADHD partners. Yeah, it's. I mean, one of the things you said earlier was you start having. So it, you know, even if you don't have ADHD, you have ADHD level symptoms. If you're missing an hour of sleep and you're neurotypical, mm -hmm. it, that's what it sounds like you're describing to me. If you're non ADHD and you're structured yeah. and you and you're you're facing these challenges, you sure might look distress might look a lot like ADHD. 
Exactly. Yep. Yep. And, and honestly, we see some of that clinically, right. Of people coming in being like, I think I have ADHD and maybe they don't, maybe it's more about lack of sleep, lack of structure, um, and, you know, changes happening in life. What's your guidance for people who are, are dealing with this? Like we've already talked about, like looking for ADHD symptoms in this part of your life is like good luck, right? Um, but at the same time, how do you guide people who are really struggling through this, this period to, uh, to find structure and be on the lookout for the things that, that might be indicators of, of longer term sort of ADHD symptoms? My First and biggest guidance is give yourself a whole lot of grace mm -hmm. and try to give your partner as much grace as, as possible too, right? Um, this is an extremely difficult time of life. Um, and yes, there's a lot of joy, but there's a whole lot of pain here too. Um, and so it's not going to look the way you expected it to look. Um, that's true whether you have ADHD or not. Um, but I think especially when you have ADHD, um, you know, trying to build in structure, trying to build in routine, trying to do all of that while manage, managing this new creature in your life, um, it's really, really hard. So giving yourself a lot of grace for all the mistakes that you're going to make, um, giving yourself a lot of grace for, you know, any mood changes, upset that happens, all these things are all expected and totally normal. Um, when it comes to, you know, kind of help my ADHD symptoms are out of control and I need you know, this can be one of the many life rafts that I need to grab onto right now to, you know, help me settle this down. You know, I think if if you're not breastfeeding, then um, talking with a psychiatrist about um, some meds um, would be useful. Um, I really think exercise, as soon as a woman is able to exercise, exercise can be a really key um, way to help answer. And I say help answer because it's not going to make it all go away. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but even if it's just, you know, pushing the stroller outside for 20 minutes, um, getting your body moving, getting outside, um, you know, bathes your, your brain in neurochemicals that you need. Um, mm -hmm. and when that estrogen level is low, we need to bathe it with as much as we possibly can. Um, and so, Getting getting our bodies in motion is one of the best way to do that, particularly when medication isn't accessible. Mm -hmm. um, so whether your medication is not accessible because you're breastfeeding or whether medication is not accessible because we can't figure out whether you have ADHD yet because everything's so in upheaval, um, going out and getting nature's um, medicine, which is exercise, yeah. um, is really key. Um, and then, you know, trying to find ways to get sleep, which is way easier said than done. Um, and used to piss me off as a new mom. <laughs> Be like, sure, great, yeah. thanks. Sleep right. when um, the baby sleeps. Sleep yeah. when the baby sleeps. That's what you always hear. Yeah. 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 Um, but you know what? There are other things that need to happen too. I need mean, yeah, to, yeah. you know, eat. Um, but finding other people to help support you so that you can get whatever sleep you possibly can like drip out of it, right? Mm -hmm. Whether that's grandparents or partners or friends or a night doula or whatever, mm -hmm. something to assist you. A night Which doula. is actually, I think, uh, Sounds it like is a superhero. nice. <laughs> well, they are. The they night are. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what they are. <laughs> they are superheroes. But it's also, I think, what you're saying is is are, are really good ideas for other people who are listening that are seeing friends or family that are going through this. Um, what great ways to help? You know, to be able to come in and and uh, I don't know, clean their house or clean a couple of bathrooms or make some meals or put some things in the freezer, like anything you can do to help. Yeah. Take the baby, you take the baby for a walk so mom can sleep. You know, um, what great ideas also to to help other people that you know are going through this. Don't just text like, "How can I help?" Right? Yeah. 
um, that answering that requires a whole lot of executive functioning yeah. um, and requires getting over all kinds of barriers of like social politeness, right? Mm-hmm. Don't say, I'd really like to come over at to and take the baby so that you can sleep. Sound good? Right? Right. Yeah. That's yeah. A binary requires yes. very little thought. Yes. Yeah. You want it to be a yes no response. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's a great great thing to say for sure. So, I'm curious. I, I am going to jump ahead a little bit in the in a different chapter of parenting life. I know that I see a lot of clients who do get diagnosed after their kids get diagnosed. And so they may not have the same like hormonal things going on, but obviously, you know, that that diagnosis is brand new. Right. So there's still a lot of questions. What would you say to those people? Like what kind of support structures or what 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 can what can they do with this new diagnosis? While there, pro- while there may not be, although there may be different hormonal changes happening, mm-hmm. um, one, you know, there probably is still something happening in their life, right? Like something led them to get their child assessed and go through that process, which is not an easy process. So something must have propelled that. So my guess is that there's some kind of stress happening in the home because we also have a new child diagnosis. Um right. And then, yeah, when, when, when adults see their struggles reflected in their kid, this is another really prime time for diagnosis to happen. Mm -hmm. Um, And one of the ones that we see the most frequently um, in our practice. Um, And, and it, it can be a giant roller coaster, Mm -hmm. right? So many different things come up for people, you know, everything from, you know, oh no, I gave this to my kid, um, to, I don't want my kid to have to struggle the way I've struggled to kind of a relieving, like, oh, finally I have an answer, you know, and then 10,000 other ones that I'm not coming Mm -hmm. up with. There's so many different responses to this and you can have all of them all at the same time. Um, And, you know, and I think the the next step after you have a diagnosis um, is to A, acknowledge that this is a big shift that's happening, right? Um, It can be easy to kind of say, well, I've you know, this has been the case for me all, all my life. It shouldn't like feel like anything new or different. Um, but it is, I've, I've had clients tell me that it feels like putting on glasses for the first time and being able to see everything clearly. Right. Um, and so when you have this new perspective over who you are and how your brain works and, and how you've lived in the world thus far, um, that's a major shift that's happening internally. Mm-hmm. And it's bound to kind of shift how you interact in your family um, and how you interact in the world. Um, mm-hmm. So again, giving yourself some grace as you go through that really difficult process um, and going and seeing if you can find someone to help you too, yeah. right? Um, getting some great coaching or therapy to help you through that process because like, because you're dealing with two new diagnoses um, and trying to find the right strategies for both of these people. Mm -hmm. Um, And so it's important that you have some help to do that. I will say as a silver lining, there is some joy that comes with discovering tools that work for one that also work for the other, right? Mm -hmm. Like for Mm -hmm. going through the process with my daughter and realizing that her accommodations we were coming up with at school were really helpful for me Mm -hmm. is right. There's, there's real uh, benefit to that synchronicity. And, and uh, that can, that can be a silver lining that is, that is, you know, truly something to be grateful for. Doesn't Mm -hmm. certainly doesn't work every time, but it's nice when it does. And we, and we see that in the literature, too, that we actually see better outcomes for kids with ADHD whose parents also have ADHD, have ADHD and know about it. That is awesome. Put that <laughs> on the poster. That, I know, right? For everyone who is listening in our community who lives with ADHD, just, just tell your kids you're welcome. <laughs> That's all you have to say. You're welcome. Exactly. Well, you know, there's got to be um, a lot more. Is it empathy that I'm 
thinking of, of because you you do understand it and you do live with it. So then you're going to empathize more with your child and not just assume that they don't care or, you know, because you know they care. You know what's going on because you've lived it. You get mm -hmm. it. And, uh, yeah, I think that, and then I think from this, the, the child's point of view too, they get to see mom and dad or both <laughs> or mom and mom, whoever's in their family that, oh, look, they struggled, but they, but they came back up. They are okay. You know, um, there's a lot of, a lot of good things about that. I, I just have a quick, a quick ADHD story. So uh, my, <laughs> My daughter uh, is an adult now. She's in college. She's living in, in Ashland away from us. And she sends me texts. This is just father-daughter stuff. And she send me, sends me these texts. And um, you're probably not going to be able to see this when I hold it up. But the other day, uh, she sent me this picture, right? Can you see that? It's a picture of a woven grass basket. And then immediately below that, can you see what she says? Hyper-focused... I am so something. I she also said, so she said this at 1.49 a.m. And it says all in all caps with so many exclamation points. Hyper focus. <laughs> I am so wide awake. Wow. And she had just <laughs> woven a basket out of grass. And I and so I had oh, written, her, I, you know, I hope that's so cute. I hope it didn't come at too great a cost. And she says, I was asleep seven minutes after sending that text. Brain got to do what a brain got to do. <laughs> oh, love which is it. just you know that's one of those things i only share that as a way for yeah. because it's it's the way i celebrate having grown up and i say i grew up and she grew up um you know for the last 20 years with you know living and learning about this stuff that we don't have to have a parent child relationship about our collective adhd anymore and that has been something that i didn't know to expect but in this stage it is enormously gratifying that we can just exchange how funny our brains are and know what to do in spite of the the challenges mm -hmm. that our brains pose for us from time to time. Well, and you know what I love seeing about that too, is that there's no shame in this like conversation. No. This is all like, hey, look, you'll yeah. get this. And, and there's humor to it. And I think that that's, that's such a healthy way because I can see it going so, um, the other way yeah. where somebody's feeling bad because they're not able to sleep or whatever. Well, so, and yeah. I I have lived for years with the shame of like knowing the genetic consequences of my ADHD, right? That, oh mm -hmm. my gosh, I hope it's easier for them than it was for me, that kind of a thing. And to see that the adaptations and the awareness and the way we spoke of ADHD in our house during all those years from being a new parent through the hard elementary school, middle school, high school period that we've sort of graduated into a new kind of relationship both with each other and with our ADHD has been really something to, to I, I think, be proud of. I'm really mm -hmm. proud of the way we talk about it. And I think that's something to look forward to. You know, if, we, if you're able to take care of yourself and do the kinds of things we've been talking about for the last half hour, um, there is something to look forward to. I got a second kid that I'm ready to, to ruin, though. So, you know, all bets are off. <laughs> Who knows what I'm going to do uh, next? So I, I love that exchange, too. And, and Nikki, I so agree that, like, the lack of shame there is what so spoke to me. Um, and as you said, Pete, the, the understanding, right, of, like, this, this is my brain. And I... And I know what it is and I'm not judging it. And I also know how to respond to it. Um, and that is exactly what we want. And that is such a gift that really only, so a non-ADHD parent who understands ADHD can help give that, right? Mm -hmm. But to have that communal experience and to be able to feel so seen, just like innately seen um, and felt by another person, you know, I think so many people with ADHD walk around in these little silos of shame and don't um, don't get that benefit. Um, and, and as you said, like this, this is a thing that ADHD parents can give to their ADHD kids that nobody else really can. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. That's something mm. I got. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> That's great. <laughs> All right. Great way to end. Yeah. So positive. Marcy, I love it. thank you so much, as always, for coming back, for, for you know, going away and weathering the pandemic and then coming back to, <laughs> to share more stories with us. We, we missed you. Thank people you so much welcome. for being here. Where, uh, where would you like to send people to learn more about you and the work that you do? Sure. So I have a blog and digital resource at adept, A-D-D-E-P-T dot org. Um, and you can also find more about my practice, Rittenhouse um, Psychological Services at rittenhousepsych.com. We will put links in the show notes. Marcy Caldwell, thank you so much for your participation here. Thank you, everyone, for downloading and listening to this show. We appreciate your time and your attention. Don't forget, if you have something to contribute about this conversation, we're going to be in the Show Talk channel and Discord, and you can join us right there by becoming a supporting member at the deluxe level or better. On behalf of Marcy Caldwell and Nikki Kinzer, I'm Pete Wright, and we'll see you back here next season. That's right. We're taking a little break. This is the last episode of season 24. We'll be back for season 25 of the ADHD podcast uh, after our July hiatus. So don't unsubscribe. We'll see you next month. Bye, everybody.